Hi, everybody. This is Dan Halsey with United Designers and uh, continuing our series of interviews about climate change. Uh, basically started with the uh, Global Repair Conference that was in town, Port Townsend, uh, Washington in early May. But we had some questions after the conference and I wanted to talk to some people about it. And a lot of it came from conversations uh, while I was there uh, with lots of great people. So I want to continue that with a few people. And the first person we're going to talk to is Alana Bliss and she's in Minnesota. And for seven years, Alana had, I, uh, and I think still do have a place, uh, a farm in Costa Rica. Yep, still. Yeah, there was an education center. Mm -hmm. And now they're located in Minnesota with a business called Green Guilds, Raising Family. And uh, we have three questions again that we're going to go through, possibly four, with her about opinions about uh, uh, ecosystem restoration, about working with uh, climate change, but also kind of getting to some understanding so we can move forward with solutions is the idea. So our first question for Alana is, what do you think is the agreed paradigm of truths we need to move forward and to find solutions? And basically the truths are, there's lots of different kinds of truths, but we really want the ones that are specific, like what is the ecological truth, the climate truth of what we're working on? What is the social truth? So what do we, what kind of understanding do we all have to have in order to move forward with solutions for climate change and trying to avoid a climate tragedy? So hi, Alana. Hi, Dan. Thanks for having me. Uh, my daughter, Karina, is with us, so she might pop up here and there. <laughs> um, I think that the truth, first and foremost, we have to acknowledge truth, which is that climate change is happening and um, that we need to take action. So that's the foundation. Um, when we deny that that's a possibility, that that's a reality, then we only, and I think, postpone the inevitable, which is more and more destabilization of our climate. And um, so I think also that it's important for us to recognize that trees are vital, that trees produce, um, not only they produce oxygen, but they also create habitat for pretty much everything. And they make life on earth um, a place where we can thrive. So the more that we have, and not just little trees, but big trees, you know, we can't just say like, oh, I'm gonna cut down this old oak tree and put this little tiny tree that's young because they're not equal. So I think we, we have to acknowledge the role that trees play. And a part of that is recreating some of the um, buying habits that we have as you know, individuals and also in the industri industries, changing some of the industrial models from using trees frivolously like for paper and toilet paper and things like that to using them more wisely with a little bit more reverence or respect and um, using things like hemp or other like fast growing plants to, to have them, you know, for like things that we are using more disposably like paper. Sure. Um, so, so I think that's a big one because, you know, there's, I've gotten into conversations or heated debates with people who are climate deniers and, and I can, I usually come to, well, okay, let's not talk about the, the car, you know, the carbon monoxide or dioxide or whatnot. Let's just talk about trees and habitat and forests and how vital those elements are to our planet. And, and I ask him, well, is it true that forests are being destroyed or reduced greatly throughout the world? Yeah. Is that human related? Yeah. Do you think that affects climate? Yeah. Okay. Then we agree that climate change is happening and it also is affected by human actions. So I think that's a big truth. Um, and then, you know, that, that goes along with just the way that we look at how we live and what we buy, all that stuff, it plays a crucial role in, in our effect on the planet and what we can, what we can do. So, you know, whether we want to just have green lawn or we want to have more habitat planted that if we don't want to eat fruit coming from the trees, at least we can provide something for, for um, shading our, our spaces and also um, for, uh, sorry. <laughs> Provide shading, shading and, and climate like mitigation within our own little yards, but also food and habitat for animals. And this is sure. this is my little Karina. <laughs> Hi, Karina. <laughs> oh. Yeah. Oh, we might have to do a little a little juggling here, but uh, it makes a very good point as to why we're having this discussion when we yeah. have a little baby there. Yeah. Uh, which is kind of the point of pretty much everything that we're coming to because everything leads to the future and it's not our future. No, it's true. And then there's a, one of my favorite sayings is um, that, 
you know, we're not given our, given the earth by our, our, our abuelos, our, sorry, our grandparents, but we're, in, we're borrowing it from our grandchildren. Right, exactly. And need to be cognizant of passing forward something. That, uh, like Lindsay Raybon, who was at a conference, was mentioning one of these sayings about you know, uh, basically uh, honoring, you know, basically honoring our ancestors. Uh, but we also need to basically honor the people going forward also. Yeah, and I like that with um, the fair share um, ethic in permaculture, you know, earth care, people care, and fair share, uh, or, you know, that's one of my favorites because we have to consider what are we giving to our children? What's the fair share of resources that we're using on our planet? And how can we actually increase fertility instead of, you know, use it up and detract it? So how can we think about our children and, and give them a better world than we inherited. And that's something that, especially with the threat of climate change, it's been a, you know, a big question that I've always had. Um, because when I was a little kid, I, my parents were called into the school by the principal and they were very concerned. And they said, you know, when we asked our, the children to draw a picture of their greatest fear, most kids were drawing a picture of their bike breaking or someone stealing something from their house. And your daughter drew a picture of climate change and global warming and <laughs> so it's it's been up there in my mind for a lot of years all oh, right right well so what we're coming down to then is, is kind of the belief system that you're you're talking about or our paradigms is that we we basically are coming to agree that climate is changing um whether or not we caused it we did make it worse climate yeah is, climate is always changing. so what we've kind of agreed then is that the human influence has accelerated the process. Yeah. If not redirected the trajectory of that change to a place that has never been before. Yeah. And perhaps climate is always changing. And that's something that, you know, we, we as humans, you know, are, have only been here for such a short period of time and we've seen extinctions happen and so forth. But like you said, we are accelerating it through our civilization and through the destruction of, of ecosystems worldwide. Right. So yeah, and by the way, as you mentioned early, this is uh, this is Dawes Glacier behind me, uh, which is in southeast Alaska, and it was amazing to see these glaciers and also see the maps, and even at the even at the centers, uh, the visitor center near Juneau, they showed the maps of how what where the glaciers where it has been like a hundred years ago. It was actually a mile down the valley from where we were standing, um, and in 2011, it lost like 427 feet. But they had wow. these lines about where it would be in 2050, 2080. And the lady said, well, actually, they're already wrong. Uh, because yeah. we're almost at the 2050 rate now that they thought yeah. it would be, you know, you know, obviously 20 years, 30 years from now. So yeah. uh, that's kind of the, the, the real truth is, is as we kind of look at all this information is understanding that the science of it is really tough. Where direction it's going is really tough, mostly because... We aren't following the path. We're not going with it. We're redirecting it. Yeah. And that's the other issue that we have too, is that we're being told a lot of things as if it was the truth when really mm -hmm. it's a guess. Yeah. And so when we come down to what a truth is, it really has to be something about, okay, we agree that the earth is in, in great change, accelerated change, which is, and I think you would agree, uh, threatening the existence of our culture, if not our species. Yeah, and ultimately, it doesn't matter what's causing it. It matters what do we do to fix it or what do we do to mitigate it and not just support human life because human life is only one strand of the web of life, but support as much of you know what's on our planet now as we can because the diversity makes strength. And the more that we have um, these beautiful forests and diverse ecosystems, the, the stronger life can thrive or the, the stronger we are as a, a whole. So... So what do you think, and this goes on to our, our second question, um, what principles, now we, we of course understand our, between you and me and a lot of the people watching this, permaculture principles, mm -hmm. basically either Holmgren or Mollison. Um, or both. <laughs> yeah, right, the blend of the both. Um, yeah. <laughs> so there's, you know, we have to have some principles for our personal life, our community, and then also our culture. So mm -hmm. do you think there are some broad principles that we should be applying to ourselves especially, but also to our culture and our communities in order to basically help change the trajectory or survive this climate change? 
Yeah, I mean, all of the permaculture principles, but I think one of them, what like kind of are summed up in my opinion as um, the principle of generative living and generative living also regenerative. Like I don't really believe in good and evil as much as I believe in generative and degenerative. And so I feel like when a culture is, or a civilization is either consciously or unconsciously being degenerative to the ecosystems and planet to each other, then that's ultimately going to be it's a destruction. Um, and so when we are able to live generatively, where we're supporting life around us, we're supporting life within our families, we're supporting the um, emotional, like being generative emotionally with our children, so with our self confidence, with each other, you know, for people and people care, but also with our ecosystems, then you know, that, that could go on indefinitely. And that's really what, you know, um, and then with that, if you're strong, you can, you can be more resistant to change. If you're weak and things change around you, then it's harder to be able to adapt. But if you're already strong, then you're able to like find ways. And I feel like that's what generative living does is it gives us that strength that we need in order to change. Mm -hmm. And so, um, so that's a big principle. And that's something that I, I do with pretty much, I try to do that with everything in my life, um, whether that's giving birth, you know, in my house to my babies in a way that makes them feel loved and supported, or if that's, um, you know, deciding to buy stuff locally or researching what kind of effect the thing I'm buying had, you know, before we got to it, generative, generative lifestyles. Um, do you need to take a, a break? We pause? <laughs> yeah, because Joseph just got here, and so I'm going to pass her off to him. All right, I'll pause here. And we're back <laughs> with a lot hey. of bliss. <laughs> a little, a little uh, handoff of the bundle to uh, yeah. Papa. Yeah. So let's, yeah, let's continue so, our, our conversation. So you were talking about regenerative living as basically one of the principles of action uh, for personally, obviously, communities and culture. How do we get that into? Our cultural practices because that's one of the big things that I work with especially in travel and working in other countries I have to be very co cognizant of the cultural practice because that's usually where the yeah. source of our problems are yeah it's true and now ultimately everyone can understand generative versus degenerative when you start to talk about things like you can you know if they say well we started using this fertilizer and now every year we have to add more and more. And then you're saying, okay, well, is that degenerative or generative? You know, if you, you, can, you don't have to say it in those words specifically, but you know, if you have to add more and more, then it's ultimately costing you more money. Your soil is suffering. And how do you create soil that's going to be of itself? Before farming and before agrochemicals, we didn't really have to worry about depleting soil so much because we, it was our it, soil itself is constantly replenishing. It's generative right? It's regenerative. It's both. But like by nature, it's generative, right? And, and, and it's also degenerative. And that's what I love about seeing it kind of uh, my, one of my friends in Costa Rica, he's this really quirky, wise uh, elder there. And he was telling me that, um, that the bacteria, there's multiple different kinds of bacteria, but they generally have three functions. There's the generative bacteria, the degenerative ones, and then the, um, the neutral ones. And the majority of bacteria are neutral of any given species. And what happens is that when the degenerative bacteria become num um, numerous enough, then the neutral ones will, will join forces with them to just to like break down stuff. So if there's not enough nutrients in the soil, there'll be more degenerative bacteria so that it breaks things down. And then once there's enough nutrients, then the generative will start to thrive. And then those neutral ones will jump over to the generative ones. And so then the soil will become more generative and things will start to thrive. Mm -hmm. and life will be supported. So I feel like that's the same with humans and with our culture is we just have to be examples. We have to continue to show what it takes to be more generative, to be both generative and regenerative because we have, there is depleted, there's depleted right. soils, there's depleted people. And so how do we give, give that um, model? How do we become that model, that inspiration for people to say, wow, look at, if you can do it, I can do it. And I, the and more of us that are too, doing you're it, mentioning you know, when I see that parallel also with people as far as there are probably generative, we need more of them, but there's vastly more neutral people than there are yeah. they're the, either the, the extremes, let's say. And those neutral yeah. people are just looking for an opportunity or looking for answers uh, to move forward. And they're basically just waiting for somebody to come up with an answer uh, for these things. Like, yeah. And, great. and generally, you know, society, um, like the, 
colonial civilization has given many answers and they say, hey, come on, let's go this way. And people are like, oh, this looks safe. And ultimately, that's what we're always looking for is what's safe and what's going to help us stay healthy. And so, you know, you have a society where you don't have to do much except for your little cog role, you know, and, and you'll be safe and protected. And, and it's really a guise because in reality, this big like industrial machine of a society is, is like eating away at the resources of our planet. So we have to start figuring out how can we create, you know, basically how can we fulfill the same needs of safety and, you know, being nurtured. Um, and then once people see that, they'll, they'll be happy to switch over because most people don't want to be degenerative. Most people aren't inherently out to like be causing problems in, you know, either ecologically or, or socially, you know, they generally want what's good. And that's why there's that saying the road to hell is paved with good intentions, right? Is because usually right. people have good intentions. And so how, you know, when you give them the opportunity, and I really saw this a lot when I came back from Costa Rica living, you know, we lived in this bubble, on um, this permaculture farm teaching and sharing these ways. And then, you know, I came back and, and like organic was really big and green was really big and people were so conscious and rain gardens, and pollinators, and everyone was talking about it. And it just took people to start bringing up these conversations and showing how to do it. And then people jump on it. And a lot of our clients for our business, you know, they, they have really good intentions and they want their um, yard to be ha like habitat and be ecologically friendly. And they want to be able to support their local ecosystem the best they can. And so that's why they hire us so that they can, they can do that and we can help them. So we've been so busy. You know? Yeah. So there's part of, so now I basically what we're talking about is the value system. We have a belief system, the value systems, and that people are actually willing to trade out some of their values or changing their values to a different expectation. Uh, whereas instead of the lawn, they now have, you know, permission or they've seen other people do this or now see that, Hey, this is actually pretty great. And they're tearing up these lawns, which were decades yeah. pretty sacred in the neighborhood. Cause you're going to lower property values by putting in a rain garden and, and that kind yeah, of, yeah. Right. So it seems that there's also, a trade-off in expectations for for climate change and what we're trying to do and like mm -hmm. what you're saying about being regenerative we have to actually change our expectations and get our value from a different set of things right i actually yeah. feel better about getting this done and now i'm actually getting my needs met uh psychologically mentally and my health also by knowing that i'm mm -hmm. making better progress here as opposed to getting my needs met by uh well the standard shopping clothes cars and all sorts of possessions uh when our biggest mm -hmm. possession which is basically the planet uh that we all share we're supposed to share is the one thing right now yeah. that's under a great threat that, that is you know it's it's basically let's just say we assume that we possess this i'm sure that's arguable uh, but we're not, yeah. <laughs> it know. might possess us. <laughs> right. Exactly. So if, and if we don't maintain it, just like they say about your teeth, if you ignore them, they'll go away. Right. So yeah. we need to basically change our, our, and trade our, our expectations and there needs to be some trade-offs and people need to value and get a really good feeling about being generative and knowing that yeah. when I get my, say my greens or my vegetables out of my backyard, hopefully, or from a small farmer. Um, yeah, locally. <laughs> yeah, locally. Um, I can also make sure that it is in a regenerative or generative process because I can go see the farm. Yeah. I can see the vegetables and actually better uh, for me that way. So um, those yeah. kind of principles and, of action are very important. Yeah, and it's true. And we're voting with our money all the time. Every time we buy something, we're saying, I support this or I don't support that. You know, I mean, I, that, that's the key. You, actually, you don't even say you don't. You just say you're supporting them if you're buying something. So when you buy something that's been produced ethically or, you know, um, in a way that's supporting the ecosystem or the people, then you're kind of constantly voting for that generative culture as well. And I'll, obviously, there's a lot of like disparity and not everyone can afford everything, but there are always creative ways to do that even if you don't have a lot of money, whether that's, you know, CSA or being a part of a buyer's club or, you know, just growing your own food. I mean, it, it's less common in the United States, but everywhere else, if you don't have, if you're poor, you grow your own food, you know, and that's just how it is because that's what people have been doing forever. So you see like the yard isn't just a grass 
space, it's actually, there's like bananas and cassava and there's all these things everywhere, you know, that, that are going to be nurturing for the people so that they always have something. And, and even if they're in, you know, apartments that you see, still see food coming out of the, you know, the buildings I've seen in Egypt, I've seen a cow on the roof, you know, it's like, uh-huh. there's just, that's just part of, part of that. So I feel like, um, I feel like that's really important. And then another thing too, to touch on around the planet, some people say, oh, the planet's going to be fine. We don't have to worry. Like, even if we all die off, it'll still be okay. And maybe the planet will be, but not the species on the planet. And we have these, this vast array of, of biodiversity that has evolved with us as a species, you know, since the, and, and some that have been here before us. And they're the ones that are really threatened is all the animals and plants that have, have been here with us and that are kind of our like ecological kin or evolutionary kin, whatnot, you know, the ones that, that are at risk. Right. And so, and that's a really, that's a very real thing. I mean, rhinos or black rhinos are, I don't remember if they're fully extinct or, you know, in the wild, but they're right there. And there's just so many, so many, we're in this great extinction. And so how can we, um, you know, it's like, we, there's one thing to just be buying things. That's very passive. Like what you buy is, you know, voting then there's also like getting involved in the community around you and being like acting locally and being able to take you know to be talking with legislators and and doing things that are going to support um environmental and socially just systems um you know and then there's also globally i mean that's that you know bill mollison says think and act globally and locally and that's like you have you also have the opportunity to maybe donate something that's going to support a generative project in another country because your money's going to go further there than it would locally. So there's so many ways that we can support this generative culture and, and make it a part of our um, daily and yearly process, you know, lifestyle. It's really huge. I mean, there's a, and then also like I used to work for this organization where we would go and pick up food that was going to go bad from warehouses before it could be sold to the co-ops to the health food stores and then give it away for free. And that, supported so many people who had didn't have the money to buy organic food but they could eat organic because they they could go get this stuff that was borderline it wasn't bad yet it was on its way out right. and so because our system especially in the united states is so wasteful there's a lot of resources to be gained there because there is no waste there's just not used resources right and everything that's it's built up either if it's not used it becomes toxic or it's just wasted it goes away either way yeah. it's lost production yeah so uh one of the our last question here um is we have to do these actions right we, there are things we need to do there's action we need to take either reduce eliminate increase and if we could get everybody to understand a purpose that we're doing these mm-hmm. actions what would be that overriding purpose that might convince people to take part in that I mean, there's self-preservation. That's like one of the most basic, like if people really recognize that they were at risk, you know, then self-preservation is a fundamental, every, every species on the planet wants to survive. It wants to, it's going to try to avoid danger. So I think that's like the basic one. I mean, that unfortunately, I, I mean, it's not the one I think is the most like graceful because I think ultimately we want to do, we should want to do good and like be more, you know, um, supportive of our, of each other and our, and our ecosystem. But that might not be the thing that actually pushes people towards doing that. It might take the need for self-preservation or community self, you know, preservation or whatnot, but that's a, that's that's kind of a foundational one. So how do we, how do we work against this whole, the, I see one of the bigger problems we have is we have an economic system that basically takes, they give so many choices that it basically distracts or masks the actual reality of the situation that we're having. Yeah. So, um, how do we, and that's basically comes from our, you know, for the first question, we have to all agree what's going on. Uh, have you seen any, like, I know you're in Costa Rica and here, what would be other than basically being informed and you also have your, basically your fingers in the ecology, literally, uh, and lived in (laughs) Costa Rica or in here, what are the things that convinced you that this is an issue or was it just a momentum of the information? Um, well, I'm pretty empathetic. Ever since I was little, I felt um, suffering and, and I didn't know what it was. And so I don't, that's just personally me. Like I have every day, I feel the suffering of, of our planet, not, not necessarily the planet, but the species on the planet. And so that's something that 
um, I struggle with a lot and I've wanted to uh, medicate myself from not feeling it because it's so intense. You know, there's times where I wake up and I can just feel the sadness, like pressure on my chest with what's happening. Mm -hmm. So that's always been there for me. So that's really where I've been motivated by it. Um, My parents were also very um, aware growing up. They were, we always, we always went out into the forest. I think getting people out into seeing healthy forests is really important. Connecting with the ecology is is vital because if we are so self-obsessed with our own humanity, and our, you know, technology and all these things that we, we don't ever get a chance to see the beauty of nature, like taking a moment to notice, oh, wow, there's a, a chickadee that's nesting right here, or there's a family of squirrels living in this tree right next to me. And that's just in my backyard, you know, and, and it's not something that I even set out to have. It just happened because, and then I'm seeing it. So little things like that, getting, getting kids to, to be out in nature is important. Mm-hmm. Um, I feel like being able to see beyond the illusion that you're talking about um, and sometimes it takes something to shake you out of it. You know, it's like my mom, I showed her I was vegan for a while. I'm not anymore. But when I was, I brought my mom this, uh, horrible, like factory farm video and she was, she was watching it and she got maybe five minutes into it. And she goes, honey, uh, I am so happy in my denial. Just leave me alone. And I, you know, I had to respect her for her honesty, that that's what she was in, that she was happy in her denial. And I think a lot of people are happy in their denial and they're not shaken out of it. And it took me being like, well, I'm not coming to Thanksgiving if you're going to have these like factory farm turkeys, (laughs) you know, Right, right. it took that, like that threat of not being able to see her family to like switch, but not to say we need to threaten each other because that's not necessarily the way, but we need to have more discipline. You know, like when you walk into a grocery store, you see all these different products, but really all you're seeing is, you know, high fructose corn syrup, you know, different variations of corn, you know, a lot of it is the same. And it's just in different, different products. And so I think that's, we have to like, I think there's a spell, not necessarily like a real magical spell, but there's like this um, illusion that humanity is kind of in, you know, and and it's, uh, it's our nature. You know, there's a way to catch a, you know, catch a baboon where you, if you dig, I saw this in a video once where this um, Bushman dug a hole into a, a termite mound and just big enough for the, the baboon to put his hand in, but not be able to pull it back out when he had a fist. And so he put seeds in the hole and the baboon was overwhelmed with curiosity. He needed to find out what was in the hole. So he put his hand in there and tried to pull it out and he couldn't to the point where he was captured. And so I feel like that's, that's a kind of a good metaphor for humanity, like with our technology and we're so obsessed. We don't want to let go of this comfort and we don't want to let it go of these technologies that we've created. So we're clinging desperately, even though it might be our own demise, like in the case of this baboon. Wow. That's you know, amazing. That's- <laughs> That's a very really good word picture because I've, yeah, I've, I've, I've heard that before, but applied to us, we're not willing to give up these things because for the fear of the loss of those, as opposed to a loss of something that we can't see, right? Yeah. It's like, I have this now and it's tangible, however minuscule it is. And you want me to give that up for something that somebody told me, I don't really understand it, uh, right. but, it's, but it's coming. Um, and it, it kind of, I mean, you kind of even get to the whole inoculation situation. It's a belief that, no, I don't think I need this as opposed to the greater good, so to speak. And there's a whole nother yeah. conversation in there. Well, right. my last question for you is, and because I know that you've traveled a lot, um, and we're talking about kind of avoiding this tragedy. Uh, I personally kind of hold uh, our culture, let's just say North America, the United States in particular, Uh, kind of responsible for a lot of what's been going on. Obviously, it's Mm -hmm. not coming. uh, But we are the Kickstarter, you might say, of -hmm. of a lot of this has happened. So when I've been when I and I've been talking to people from Costa Rica, and one of our previous recordings was somebody from there and the climate that's changing there. On the other hand, Costa Rica put in some huge laws in ecological laws about cutting trees, things like that. Um, Yeah. So how do we now apply these changes? to all these different countries, especially like I think of Haiti, or I think of the yeah. Dominican Republic, that have their own issues. And I would say essentially there is a problem with, with ocean pollution and trash yeah. and things like that, most of which yeah. comes from here. Um, yep. But on the other hand, so how do we talk to these other countries about this? And when they're the ones that are basically gonna suffer worse than we are, you know, yeah. we're insulated and we will keep ourselves insulated. And there are certain people that will make sure that we are. Uh, Mm -hmm. which is because that's where power comes from. Mm -hmm. So how do we talk to these other countries about climate change 
when we're kind of the problem. Yeah, I mean, ultimately, that's like, it's the hypocrisy of the situation is we have to change ourselves, ultimately. I mean, and we each, and we can't really ever change other people. We can inspire them to, to change. We can try to force them to change, but we can change. It's best, I think, to change yourself and, and then show, like we were talking about earlier, show examples of how you can thrive. Um, and then as we continue to change and create these little microcosms of this change in our own lives, then we can move out and talk to other people about it. And I think that with um, having lived in the United States and grown up here and then lived in another country, um, there's a lot of things we take for granted as far as our wisdom and knowledge around um, like entrepreneurship, for example. And so when moving, so when I moved down there, I had all this stuff that I'd seen and just kind of been around, not even taken on in my own way, my own way that when I moved down there, I realized, wow, that people don't really even acknowledge this stuff or know about this. And so how to be able to, um, to take that kind of wisdom and knowledge and apply it in a non-forceful way is important. Um, mm -hmm. When you tell someone what to do, then they won't necessarily want to do it. But if you, if you kind of make them think it's their idea, <laughs> then they, they generally want to. I mean, as a mother, that kind of comes up a lot. Not to be manipulative, but it's, it's better to not force people to do things. Um, so I, and I think that that applies here and beyond is finding ways to be inspirational, to show really cool ways, like cool ideas and solutions to problems and be able to receive them from other countries and people that are doing that already. You know, like with Costa Rica, they're, they've got some awesome laws in place. And if we brought those and we said, hey, look at what they're doing and brought them to our local legislators and say, how can we do this in, you know, on a local level? I think that we could have great success. It's, I guess it's an interchange of um, knowledge and, and ideas and solutions. And that's why I like appropriate technology so much is anyone can do it anywhere. And so you have, you know, you don't have this like beyond your reach solution that's like, oh, that would be cool, but I can't afford it. It's like, well, anyone can go to the, the hardware store and get the tools that they need in order to do this, you know? So I feel like that's, um, that's one way. Well, their, but, yeah, their lifestyle let's just say Costa Rica or some of these other countries, their lifestyle and being kind of an agrarian lifestyle has mm -hmm. probably the smallest footprint. Yeah. Relative to India. <laughs> yeah. Right. Relative to, to our footprint. Yeah. And so part of me thinks like we need to basically focus, you know, first be the change right yeah. for this. And we have a lot of issues and we're talking about global climate change, but we're also saying that, um, the majority of that change and the majority of the effect is going to come from within and also from in our country and also let's just say like they call them the, the developed countries in quotes. Uh, mm -hmm, yeah. It's basically the undeveloped countries, which they call that because they're not, they're not part of the economic system as much as they would like them to be, but they're also not causing the problem. Yeah, that's true. And unfortunately, they're being preyed upon often by the developed countries for their resources. And so protecting, like, if we can find ways to protect other countries from our misbehaving <laughs> or, you know, the waste or pollution or whatever, you know, whatever, um, that would be good too. I feel like, yeah, I feel like it's, it's really, it's like you can't, I don't, you know, you hear do as I say, not as I do. You know, parents used to say that all the time. Do as I say, not as I do. But really, that that's so shallow. And and the, you know, kids who hear that, they don't. They're like, yeah, whatever. I'm going to do what you what you do because you're showing me how. Because we live and learn by examples. And so that's really. I keep coming back to that again and again. Like we just need to have more local solidarity. And then when we do that, and we go out to other countries and we say, you know, bringing permaculture principles or whatnot, then and solutions then they're more likely to receive it because you're actually a living embodiment of that instead of just um, reading the books and regurgitating back what, you know, I'm saying that's, for me, that's a really big part of it. And it's in so inspiring. And, you know, when I go to another community in another country and I'm talking with them and they're, they're getting so excited about different ideas and, and then I'm, you know, that's, that's the way they start to embrace it. Or in Costa Rica, um, I never would tell my neighbors, you shouldn't use Roundup. You know, you're bad why are you doing this? Because, and, or like something like, you know, you should be organic. You should start doing organic farming because one, they've been doing this for ages and they know a lot more than I do about their, you know, agricultural practices. Two, I don't know what they need, what they're needing or whatnot. And three, it's like, 
I, um, I don't have a market for them to sell those products and I don't have a, a way for them to do it. So, I mean, if you really wanted to like work with a community in another country, starting a market for them and saying, Hey, we'll buy the stuff that you're selling if you grow it like this. And then you have, you know, then you work in your community to like organize the, the, the people who want to buy from that. Like we do with our cacao. We bring up cacao from Costa Rica, from um, the indigenous people there. They grow it all organic and they have this really inter integral way of processing it. And then we have a buyer's club up here and they buy it, you know. And so it's just things like that are ways that you can create those beneficial, mutually beneficial relationships. And then that inspires each other because ultimately when, when the resources of a community are constantly being taken out of the community, that's when poverty happens. You know, I asked my neighbor in Costa Rica, do you remember before electricity? And he was like, he smiles for a second. He says, oh yeah, those were the, those were the days of abundance. And I said, well, what about now? And he goes, now is a day of debt. And I said, well, why don't you go back to abundance? You know, you know it. He's like, well, once you get this technology, you can't go back. Like, you know, we, ha we have the TV. Now we want for more and we want, you know. And so it's like, I don't know. I feel like the, the, the resources of that community are starting to go out. They're going to, the, to all these different companies that don't actually support that local community. And so they become more and more poor. And so I feel like once we start bringing in models of self-reliance, and so, you know, solidarity, then it ends up being more, more um, generative for that community and, and for ourselves, because now we're feeling good. And then we, we can say, we can come back here and say, Hey, guess what? I've got this great product from this community and they're doing it all integrally. Do you want to buy it and support? And now you can feel more generative too. <laughs> right. Right. If we're, if we're buying that. And of course that brings up other questions as far as if we are buying it, of course they're exporting it and we're importing it. Yeah, um, and it'd be nice if, and of course, the reason that they're selling it is almost like because they want electricity. Uh, yeah, exactly. <laughs> buy the TV and and things like that. So, um, so but with that, at least you can make an influence. Or like when you were down there, um, you can show people by acting. You know, by acting differently, mm -hmm. and then they can see. And we've had that success in Haiti with you know one farmer out of twenty, uh, thankfully doing what we asked. But then he was the model for everybody else. Yeah, he was successful. Then oh, yeah. everybody paid attention, you know. And it's the same thing in the, in our community in Costa Rica. We held a PDC there, and we taught the farmers permaculture. And we um, there was a Kathy Rose, who is a permaculture teacher from here in Minnesota. She came down, and and we did this. And now two of those, no, three of the of the people that were in that class are they're living those those principles, and they have businesses. One of them is selling um, produce and things to the beach tourists, and you know, it's in this mountain community, 45 minutes from the beach, and he's got this huge greenhouse. All he went out and he found all these spiders and brought them in to the greenhouse so that they could eat the you know the pests. And he you know he was really using the principles in action. And then another two uh, women, they started a, um, a organic egg production, and they started selling to the beach too because that's their closest market. And so these two, you know, these three people, they, they got so inspired by permaculture that they started actually doing them. And then they bring more abundance in their lives, financial abundance, but also resources through, you know, all different types of resources. Right. And, it's pretty and they're modeling it for other people at the same time, their community um, that way. And that's, and, and part of that too, is that they're getting their needs met. And yeah. And be more creative. So I think permaculture in, in, in the beginning uh, starts with people getting better production, not losing, not being dependent on Roundup, not being dependent on the fertilizers, learning yeah. about compost and finding how their needs are met now easier, which gives mm -hmm. them time to at least, first of all, start thinking of solutions, acting differently and raising themselves up ecologically or their farm or raising the capacity of what they can grow. But it yeah. also gives them an opportunity to become the community and not be, um, you might say, under stress or needing outside uh, resources at that point. Yep. Which yeah, and then in this case too, this the families, these families were the poorest families in the in this community, and now they're able to hire people to do their work from within the community, and it's just table the tables are turning within that, and it's pretty amazing to see, especially because they they're the ones that have more native like indigenous blood, and so they've always been looked down upon, and so now they've got this like new momentum, and it feels pretty good to be able to empower people that way, and and um. Right. Yeah, it's, and you know, then I've also it's seen it. Brand. <laughs> yeah, I've also seen it too, where, um, you know, we had swales on our land and, and we didn't tell anyone about them. We weren't like going out and 
with this permaculture flag, like, you know, in the community, we just did it. And farmers saw that because they would walk through our land all the time. And next thing you know, I saw swales in the coffee fields. And I was like, look, this is happening. It's starting to spread. <laughs> sure. You know, because sure. that's like, that's the thing. If you see that it works, then you can adapt it. If you have to experiment and take a risk and you're already really tight on cash or, you know, you're living more in a poor mentality, then you're not as willing to, to make those sacrifices and changes. Right. There's a lot of risk for people, especially when we talk about the calories that they're trying to get out of their system and mm -hmm. you want them to spend hundreds, if not tens of thousands of calories to make change. Yeah. And they're not sure whether it's going to work, but just by your words, they're supposed to make these differences. But that's where, again, it depends upon a few early adopters or there's those first few people that can make that change mm -hmm. and model it for everybody else, which is hopefully that's kind of what Hopefully we're doing, you're doing in your lifestyle, other people doing permaculture, people growing their own food or whatever might be uh, in their work um, mm -hmm. or their design work, things like that. Um, and that basically is modeling that. So yeah, uh, well, I really appreciate your time to talk to us today and help us go yeah. through questions. And, and uh, hopefully we can talk to you again sometime as you're working in your different projects. And yeah, my pleasure. Checking in with you and... Uh, Again, we appreciate your time. This is Alana Bliss from Good Guilds in Minnesota. Thank you, Alana. And uh, Thank you. I invited Joey, too. I think we might have seen him walking back and forth back there. Yeah. Oh. yeah. All right. Thank you. All right. Awesome. Well, have a beautiful day, and thanks again for having me. All right. Take care. Bye-bye. Thanks. You, too. Bye. Thank you, everybody. This is uh, Dan Halsey with United Designers, and uh, another great interview with one of our people, all over the world that are doing uh, ecological work, ecological design, and using permaculture to really help fix some of the problems that we have, and then also bring together other people in teaching and in design and modeling, basically, good behavior and cultural practices. Thanks again, and we'll see you next time.